This is the Multi-Faith Matters Podcast. I'm your host, John Morgan. Well, this is the podcast for Multi-Faith Matters, and I'm the host, John Moorhead, and I'm privileged to have three guests today who are representing a religious group called Summum, and hopefully I've pronounced that part uh, correctly. Um, and uh, I'm embarrassed to say that uh, they're based in Salt Lake City, and I'm a little bit north of that uh, in Utah, and I-, I didn't know about these folks and what they're doing and what they're about until a, a scholarly friend of mine, Jay uh, Gordon Melton, uh, who specializes in new religious movements, said, hey, there's this group near you that you might want to get to know. And uh, we're finally following through on that. And I'm going to let uh, my three guests uh, briefly introduce themselves before we learn more about uh, their religious beliefs and practices so that I don't make mistakes in pronouncing their names. So I'll turn it over to you folks to introduce yourselves. Thanks for being on the podcast, by the way. Sure, thank you. Um, my name is Sue Manu. I am the president of Summum, and um, I do a lot of the gardening and that sort of thing around Summum. Um, we all volunteer our time. We are not paid by Summum. We do it on our own because we feel like it's a, a worthwhile cause. I also am a piano teacher. I have taught piano up at the University of Utah for several years. Um, now I'm retired and still doing teaching, but yeah, basically it. Great. My name is Brian Ayo. I'm the uh, vice president of SEMUM. Um, I have a background in information technology. I do computer stuff as my regular job. Um, obviously, with my experience there, I, I help take care of the IT needs for SEMUM. And uh, yeah. Yeah, he created our website, so he's the guy responsible for that. Very good. You guys have a great website presence, and in the podcast description notes, I'll put links to uh, to your websites there. Great. And I'm Ron Tumu, and uh, I'm a funeral director, licensed funeral director. I'm retired now, but I've been in uh, funeral directing for you know, 30, 40 years in management. So now I'm retired, and so I just use my time to assist someone in what they're doing and, and of course, work with them on education. Well, very good. Again, thank you all for being here. I appreciate you carving out the time and sharing uh, what you're all about. I I like to begin these conversations on a personal note. Can you share with me, those of you who feel comfortable, what is it that uh, led you to this spiritual path that you're on now? And, And how would you talk about it? I know Christians talk about conversion. Uh, other religious traditions talk about enlightenment. What would be the appropriate term that you would use, and how did you come to where you are today? Well, either of those terms are correct. I mean, conversion can mean the same thing as, you know, just moving on down the road. Um, You know, you decide you become fulfilled in one thing, and you move to something else, and that's basically what happened to me. My background is just a Christian church, Christian church, Disciples of Christ. I went to Bible school, you know, um, had to go to church every Sunday, no matter what time I came in from a date, um, that was expected. But when I got away to college, I went to church and I was sitting there and I said, I feel like a hypocrite because I don't believe this. Hmm. This does not touch me in any way. Subsequently, I learned to meditate in the TM movement, Transcendental Meditation. And that touched me better. I felt like that was something that was more appropriate for me. I felt more connected to who I was through the meditation. So anyway, down the road, I went to a lecture that Corky gave up at the U, the University of Utah. And at first I was like, oh, come on, this is really bizarre. He's had experience with extraterrestrials and you know, mummification and all of that. But as I went, but it sort of piqued my interest. 
And as I went and learned more, I began to see that it was something that could be a possibility for me and felt like it was where I needed to be. And I think that happens in all religions and all philosophies. You are where you're meant to be. And just because you, I mean, my parents and my siblings are not happy that I have left the family and the fold, but for me, it's the right direction. And so that's kind of how I have come to this point, I suppose. Okay, thank you for sharing that journey. Sure. Um, you mentioned Corky. Corky is the, uh, the founder of Samum Samum Bona Mom and Ra. Um, and I, you know, I had a similar uh, experience. I was raised Catholic. Um, and, um, you know, when I was around 19 or so, you know, I, in my teenage years, you know, I started questioning the, the, the Catholic Church. Christianity and you know I had questions about life that I felt were not being um, answered or addressed and uh, I started looking around and I had uh, received a little business card on my car after watching Close Encounters of the Third Kind um, uh, back in uh, when was it 1977 and um and the little card, you know, advertised the class that Corky had given, was giving up at the University of Utah, and I attended the class. When I first read the card, I thought, oh, this is one of those alien abductees that I had heard and read about, and I thought, what kind of a person, I got to check this out to see what kind of a person, you know, one of these people is. And um, it turned out he was a very down-to-earth person when he gave his presentation, and uh, he did have an extraordinary story. Um, but he talked about some very interesting concepts that I thought, you know, this is this is worth checking into. And so I did. And ever since then, you know, I was pretty much involved. Great. Thank you so much. And uh, my experience with uh, Psalm goes uh, way back. I mean, that, that quirky when I was at the University of Utah back in the 60s. And this was before he had this experience. And my own personal background, I was raised LDS. And uh, I was first student, and I know that I got kicked out of seminary because I asked the wrong questions about things. <laughs> I got uncomfortable with it. And um, of course, I got older. My parents were hoping I'd go on a mission. And, and when they asked me, I went, you know, I have got so many Christian friends, Jewish friends, and I know their parents, and they are great people. I mean, I know all these people, and they go to church, and, and they take care of the community, and they have all of these you know, community benefits with each one. And I said, I don't think that there is one particular way to go. I, I don't feel like I need to go out and have one person change their religious philosophy because they seem to all be working really well with all of them and they're great people. And so um, obviously they didn't invite me <laughs> to go on a mission. But um, I used to read a lot of different philosophies books. I moved to California and, and uh, Maharishi Mahamash Yogi was there and I learned Transcendental Meditation and, and uh, sat at the, in, in meetings with a lot of different gurus. And I was always looking for something because all of the different religions felt like the people that were really involved with them, it was working really well for them. And so for me, I thought, there must be some sort of a unifying situation that kind of brings them all together. And I came up that I used to come up this Utah all the time skiing with Corky and, and he told me about this experience and he told me about the principles. And when he told me about the principles, it seemed to be like it was a kind of a fabric that kind of pulled them all together. But what also did it was it pulled science and religion together. And a lot of times, you know, there's a lot of fight between them. Mm -hmm. But the principles kind of come unify them in such a way that um, I just felt comfortable with all of them. It gave me a better understanding of my own uh, Mormon religious philosophy and a better appreciation of what was behind it. And uh, it made it very easy for me to uh, talk to other people of other religions because it, it's, it allowed me to kind of see the really the foundation of, of these uh, religious philosophies and how wonderful they all are in order to help people move along the, a path in a very ethical way, right? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, that's kind of my way of 
coming into this. I appreciate everybody sharing their story. You have mentioned uh, uh, the founder. Can you talk about uh, the founder and the origins and, and how your group came about? Um, in 1975, Porky had an experience with what he called extracelestial being, beings that come to the planet to assist those searching for the keys to creation. And I mean, it's happened over and over again. I mean, look at Moses and the burning bush. Paul had a, a, someone, you know, come to him, Christ supposedly, um, you know, Joseph Smith had an experience and Cork had the same thing. And the Sama individuals tasked him with several things. He was to build the pyramid. He was to begin mummification in this day and age because there are people ready for this um, to help them move on. Um, because someone believes that people, that the spirit, the soul moves on, not this body, this neat body, but the soul moves on and learns and um, experiences many, many things. And he was to create the nectars of publication, which are alcoholic, which we use in coordination with the meditation. We just drink a small amount before we meditate. And meditation was another thing. But the main thing was he was to teach the principles in their purity because they had become degenerated over time. And many religions had taken them. I mean, the Ten Commandments are simply, most of them about cause and effect. Don't lie because it's going to come back at you. Don't kill because what you do is going to have an effect. And it's not going to be good, basically, for you. Um, you know, and so that's kind of what he began to do. He began to give classes on the principles. And um, anything else anybody want to say? No, I mean, that, that, that's, that's a good basically, introduction. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot there's of details so much more there. to get into, but that's yeah. a good overview. If you read uh, on, on the website, his first encounter story, I don't know if you have, it's really a well- uh, well said story about what happened. I mean, he he didn't believe that what was happening to him was happening to him. He thought someone had slipped him some some drug at work, and he had this experience. But that was not the case. So yeah. Okay. Yeah, I pre appreciate that. I did have a chance to review the material on the website, and again, we'll put in the program notes. Um, so folks who, who hear and uh, see our conversation, they want to pursue it further. We're just trying to give them a little introduction and, and overview, and hopefully they'll be intrigued and, and want to learn more. Um, what are some of those principles? What, what, what are some very important principles and teachings that would be found in your organization? One of the principles yeah, go ahead. is uh, cause and effect. And what's really interesting, these principles have been around forever. I mean, there's nothing that can ever, I mean, it's the yeah. science that created the universe, really. And cause and effect is, is obviously there is a, for every effect, there is a cause. And it's a never ending little situation. And the thing is, is that these principles, because they're very ancient, those individuals that try to introduce them to, the general public in order to make their life a little more easier, a little more meaningful, and prepare them for, for to, to progress on, that they had to tell a story. It's just like I can tell you a story. Have you ever woke up in the morning and you felt really good? I mean, not just happy, happy, but just really kind of like peace and blissful. And you get in your car and you drive down the road and some idiot almost runs you off the road, right? And it just all of a sudden is just, oh, that guy is just crazy, you know, or somebody at work, somebody says something and it just really takes your part. And it's really interesting. The one thing that we do in life is the clothes we buy, the relationships we are, everything that we're involved in is so that we're happy, right? 
We do these things to make us happy so that we feel joy and, and comfort and peace with inside of ourselves. And that is the real thing that you actually own. That's yours. And you have complete control over that. What's going on on the planet, right, is just stuff happening. There's not much you can do about this and that. You can interparticipate a little bit, rub on it a little bit, but I mean, life's going to happen. And so it's so interesting, the thing that we cherish the most and the reason we do all the things we do is so that we can be happy, enjoy. And yet you let some idiot driving down the road that you'll never meet reach inside of you and just tear out that joy. And that belongs to you, right? Of course, yeah. Yeah, and we, yet we strive so hard to achieve it, and yet we just let it go in an instant. And the problem with that is that under the law of cause and effect, it rests with inside of you. If you get mad at work and you've got a bad day and things are going wrong, it puts a vibe on you. The vibration is one of the principles. It puts a vibe on you. And then when you come home, you literally infect the people that care about you the most, right? The mm -hmm. next door neighbor doesn't care whether you're happy or sad, right? Your other social, your, your co-workers don't care. The people that care about you are infected by it because they have their own thing going on, right? They got their life going on, this, that, and another. And yet, they put it aside so they can come home and, and be happy and maybe make dinner and take care of the kids and stuff. And here you come home with this vibe, right? That you've picked up, you voluntarily allowed your bliss to go away, you grab the hold of this and you hung on to it. And you bring it home and you infect everybody in the whole house and they got their own stuff. And so what does it do? It infects them, right? It's cause and effect. Now, by me telling you this story, I put a whole lot of stuff on top of a very simple principle of cause and effect. And we look at all of the different religious philosophies and all the stories and all of the things that they say. They're simply talking about these very simple principles, like cause and effect, right? And they have to explain it to somebody. And so they will tell a story. And sometimes the story becomes more important than what's the underlying reason that's behind it. Because creation cares about all of us, right? And it wants us to move forward in the most peaceful way possible. And all religions try to infuse some sort of ethical um, framework, right? For people to go out, for your kids to go out and be good to each other, not lie, cheat and that bringing everybody together in a very peaceful manner. And religions, they have organizations and groups that help bring people together and keep them focused on that, right? And it assists them on their journey. But underneath these principles, underneath all of that are these principles for the reasons why, right? Turn the other cheek when somebody hits you. Well, what are you gonna do? Wait around until somebody hits you in the face and you're gonna turn your cheek? It's the same thing as cause and effect. When somebody does something to you, you can get mad. We all get mad, but allowing it to reach inside of you and take that joy and take it away from you. I mean, why? It's so easy to lose and so hard to get. We go gather all these things to get it and we throw it away in an instant. And a lot of times people we don't care about <laughs> offend us. And all of a sudden we spend all day and all night running that movie in our head, what we should have done, all of this, that, and another. And you could be at peace, right? Is it possible? It belongs to you, but yet we give it away. And then we spend all our time focusing. Anyway, that's a cause and effect. Okay. Anything else that you would consider <laughs> some of the more significant teachings? Well, they're, they're um, so... The teachings are based on what, what uh, is called the grand principle of creation. And out of that principle, that, you know, that principle addresses the questions of um, what caused the Big Bang? Where did God come from? Uh, a lot of questions that people have about the mysteries of life and creation and existence. And out of that principle come seven principles, um, uh, 
seven fundamental principles. There's a principle of uh, there's the principle of cause and effect that Ron mentioned. There's also the principle of psychokinesis, which is stating that the underlying essence of the universe and life and everything is combined. There's the principle of correspondence, which means um, different levels of life and being are related because the fundamental laws are at work at all the different levels. There's vibration, the principle of vibration, everything is vibrating. There's the principle of opposition. If you look around, you see opposites everywhere in nature. There's the principle of rhythm. You know, we see the seasons, you know, we go back and forth with our emotions. The principle of cause and effect that Ron mentioned, you know, you can you can see the domino effect going on in, in, in events in life. And then the principle of gender, um, meaning that uh, when any type of creation takes place, there's a masculine and a feminine force coming together to produce the creation. A good example is when a man and a woman conceive a, a baby. But those are the, the fundamental principles, and, and those are typically what we introduce people to when they first want to learn about the uh, some of the philosophy. Well, thank you for summarizing those principles. Um, usually when people have a religion or a worldview, even atheism, I think this is the case, there, there's a way of viewing reality and viewing the human challenge or the human problem. And then we follow a pathway that we think will help address that problem or that challenge in the best way. What, what is your understanding of the human condition and how do your principles and, and your spiritual practices, how do they help us on that journey? Well, I, for me, I think realizing that what we are in is actually a movie that we are viewing. And either we can get totally involved in the movie because we have wishes, wants, and desires. Everybody wants different things. And that carrot is constantly put in front of you because everything programs you that that is what you should have in order to be happy that you need to have a nice car, you need to have a good house, you need to get married, you need to have children, you need to have this, you need that, whatever. Advertising is always telling you, you need to have this in order to be better. And the realization, I mean, even who was it that said, life is a play and we are all actors upon the stage. I mean, you know, wasn't that Shakespeare? I mean, even back then he realized that. And that, you know, your perspective of what's going on is your responsibility. That either you can get totally involved and then you are, then you are thrust into everything that's going on in this universe. And the principles continue to happen. And either you can get control of yourself and move yourself peacefully down the path or you can get involved in it and both are good. It just depends on your perspective and where you're at. But if for me, learning the meditation and allowing myself to step away from some of the things that are going on has helped keep me a little bit more stable and peaceful and have a more, you know, a nicer time in life, I suppose, and, and has made me a little bit more peace, at peace with me. And because, you know, you're not responsible for anyone else but yourself. And um, I think probably the biggest lesson of some of them is the fact that you are responsible. Either you can get up and, you know, get caught up in the cause and effect of something, or you can step away momentarily. Um, but you have to realize what's going on with you before you are able to do that. You have to say, oh my gosh, I'm really getting involved in this movie. I mean, it's like watching a movie in a theater. You can't change that movie when you're sitting there. Either you can get totally involved in the, in the movie or you can view it from a different perspective. So it's really about perspective in the end. You know, I, I was just going to say, you know, someone is a word that means the sum total of all or the highest and greatest. Now, you can, sub, you can substitute the word God or love or creative energy or whatever you want for that word. 
um, you know, we just speak about it in a different way, that's all. But they are all principles of that higher force, that creative force that did everything, not just this tiny, I mean, if you look at the, the um, images from the telescope that they've sent out, you can see how small we really are. I mean, it's significant our lives, I'm not saying that, but in the bigger picture, we're not terribly big in that way. When you consider everything, all the wonders and workings, you know, of creation. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I thought I would just kind of um, say that. Okay. That a yeah, I appreciate that. Anything you gentlemen want to add to that? Um, you know, as you mentioned the meditation, I mean, that's 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 a very very important thing. Um, if if we take the principle of, for example, opposition, that says that there's two sides to everything, and we can find ample example of of that all around. And if we look at this physical life that we live in, um, if there is an opposite side, then there must be an opposite, a different a other side of the coin to this physical life that we are so involved in. And meditation, the meditation that we teach helps you to start to develop or discover that other side. Um, you know, a, a big problem well, that I see is, is for a lot of people, life is out of balance. And the nature always want, seeks, wants to seek balance. There's a harmony and balance, but everybody's lives are so out of balance. And that, I would say that imbalance stems from this lack of having a relationship with the other side. You know, people talk about having a spirit or a soul and have a belief in it, but that's as far as it goes. They have no realization of that other aspect, that complementing aspect. And the meditation that we teach helps people to discover that and bring themselves into more of a balance where then it is easier to navigate through this thing we call life. Yeah, the meditation helps you learn to focus your attention where you wish to have it. And that's important. I mean, um, goldfish have more attention span than humans usually. <laughs> I mean, it's just sad that we've allowed, I mean, our brain wants to go to anything that, oh, that, oh, that, oh, that. But the meditation helps you to rein that in a little bit. And now, meditation, it, that doesn't happen instantly. It is a practice that you do that, and you have to persist in it. I mean, you know, it's like anything, it's an art form to be able to sit and meditate, put your attention inside of yourself instead of all of the things because your thoughts are gonna just keep jumping at you. They always do until you learn how to focus within and nothing in, a spot where there is nothing, where you are open to learning instead of telling somebody or asking for something. That's kind of what the meditation will do, will help with. Okay, in, in, um, in different, do you have something to add? Sorry, go ahead. Uh, you know, like Sue said, the meditation, you know, as, as Sue was saying, we don't believe that there is only one way. I mean, some of them isn't the way, and everybody has to migrate down to the pyramid and be in that special building. Because where you are, you happen to be there because the things that are fulfilling you are drawing you there, right? And like religions, they only work if you participate in them, right? If you begin to get active and you get involved with them, they work for everybody, right? They, they assist you in becoming more fulfilled with yourself, and, and be more in harmony with, with everything in, in, around you. And meditation, I mean, it's, not, it's nice now that you're talking about just mindfulness, right, in schools and things like that. And meditation of any kind is an assistance. Even prayer is an assistance, right? 
if you sit and do the rosary, you're in meditation. All of these different forms are simply a way that humankind can step aside, like Sue says, step aside and observe what's going on in your life and not allow it to affect you so much. And so as Sue said, it's, if you go to the gym and you look at the weights, not a lot's gonna happen. You have to go in there and lift the weights. You have to push them. And the more you work at something, the stronger you get at it, the more accomplished you become at it. And what's really interesting in life, we all want to have a happy, wonderful life, but yet we learn the most by some of the most, the toughest situations we get into, right? We've learned the most. And one can kick against the pricks and be all mad about that thing happening. But yet, even though it comes and you're not happy about it, if you can step away from it, you can see the cause and effect that got you involved in it or the family involved in it and allows you to make a very smooth transition and try to help everything move in a more progressive way, a more meaningful way. Anyway. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's all very helpful. I, I found it interesting that what you talked about uh, not being one path, uh, not being the only true religious pathway as you understand it. Would, would it be correct then to understand your view is that perhaps what your group is doing is taking the underlying principles of other religious traditions and probably and maybe uh, removing or sweeping away some misunderstandings. Uh, in other words, what's the relationship between your principles, your teachings, and how you see it connecting with other religious traditions? You know, Corky said, often said, you don't have to quit whatever religion you are in. It's perfect. Do it. But use the principles within that religion to help you have a deeper understanding of what is being said. And, you know, Corky also used to say, don't believe a word I say, because belief is just that. It's not a real knowledge. And until you can go through what he called the systematic law of learning, you don't really have any knowledge. It's like, if I said, okay, you've never tasted an almond before, and I'm trying to describe to you what an almond tastes like. Do you really know what that almond tastes like? Probably not until you take the almond, put it in your mouth and experience it. And that's what counts is the experience. And so the principles, it also says within the summer book are the reconciler, the great reconciler of all religious philosophies, science, everything, because you can use them in everything and see how they correspond to one another. Uh, in terms so, of, oh, I'm sorry, did you just something to add? I was just going to say, you know, um, for me, you know, as I, I, as I started get, getting familiar more with the Summum philosophy, and then I started looking back at the things I had learned from Catholicism and Christianity, stories that I had read in the Bible, I, you know, I had aha moments. I'm going, ah, now I understand what this metaphor was about. You know, there's a lot of stories that are metaphors for something. And, and from learning about the Summum philosophy and then looking back at things again, I had a better appreciation for the Catholic Church now than I did when I was, you know, going to Mass every week and so forth. And so, you know, stories I read now in the Bible or whatever, you know, the metaphors that they that they have, I've gone, oh, no, now I feel I understand the point that they were trying to make. And it just comes down to this principle at work in life and to become aware of it. And the funny thing is, you know, we have, we read from different philosophical and religious texts. We just got through it recently with the Quran. And we have read the Bhagavad Gita, Upanishads, lots of Osho, we've read Krishnamurti, a lot of different texts. And it's interesting. Yeah, and, and the Bible. And it's interesting throughout every single text are the principles. They are all there, yet they all want to fight each other and say they're the best. And yet, if you just take a look at the underlying foundation of them all, it is the principle. 
So you mentioned several religious texts there. Do you uh, have your own unique religious texts that you would also look to, or are you looking at other sacred texts from various traditions through the lens of the principles? What's the place of sacred writings for you? Well, for us, uh, we have a book called Some Unsealed Except to the Open Mind. And that has the principles plus a lot of other things. I mean, we're just we're just touching the surface here. Sure. I mean, um, people would need to go investigate if they are interested in learning more. Um, but yeah, that is the text that we have, but we feel like it's important to look at others as well and see how the principles fit in with their philosophies. Okay, that's very helpful. What, I think if folks were to, to drive by uh, your facility, they would be struck by the pyramid in Salt Lake City. What mm -hmm. is the significance of the symbol of the pyramid for you? And then we'll talk a little bit about the practice of mummification. Let's start with the, the, the pyramid. The pyramid is interesting. I mean, obviously there's some in Egypt, they're in South America, they're basically all over. The pyramid, uh, the one that we have, it looks like he built it exactly on the same mathematical formula as the Great Pyramid in Egypt. And what's interesting about it, if you want to walk outside and out into the sun, right? And you take a piece of glass and you hold it up to the sun, what happens? The sun goes right through it. That pure creative energy goes right through it. But if you take that piece of glass and you carve it in a particular way and turn it into a magnifying glass, it has no moving parts, right? But yet it takes that pure creative energy and literally focuses it down and can transform matter into energy, right? And start something on fire. And basically the mathematics of the pyramid, the DNA in your body is designed on that mathematical formula of phi. The Sistine Chapel was built on phi, the Parthenon. A lot of, of ancient architects realize that there is a particular relationship, a formula that this in relationship to this has a very harmonic feel to it. Even the Last Supper was, when it was painted, was designed on fly. And so what the pyramid does is just simply focuses pure creative energy and allows it to be a very creative environment, okay? And so when you walk in there, you can feel that. And churches have that too. When I was in Mexico, I remember being in Mexico a long time ago and there was a chapel where people, there was a big, huge area where people were on their knees and they were saying Hail Marys as they went to the chapel so that they could go into the chapel. When you walked in there, you could feel that energy, right? Because all of those people were at peace or trying to be at peace is bring that energy. And so the pyramid is just simply a natural uh, environment that we use so when we go in there it's a little more creative it allows you to um, sort of relax with things because in reality we all have our own personal challenges right we all have our little things that we're working on and when you are in the pyramid because of that creative energy that creative energy wants to simply move us forward right is that what creative energy does mm -hmm. it moves you forward and so when you go in there it allows us to sort of see or feel some of the things, some of the little buttons that are sticking on us, you know, the things that set us off. <laughs> and allows us to kind of get a handle on it a little easier. So it's just a very creative environment for uh, the people to come in there and spend some time. It can also help, help you, allow you to quiet your mind, stop all the chatter. There is something about being in the pyramid that can help with that. Okay, that's very, okay. Anything else you want to add to that or is that kind of a good summary of understanding the significance yeah, of the period? Good. Okay, let's, let's talk about, uh, I know when I first, uh, maybe a lot of folks do this, when I first uh, looked for your website, um, you've got some different extensions there that'll bring up different things. The, one of the first things I found was uh, your, your references to mummification. Can you talk about the significance of that uh, in terms of belief and, and ritual and, and practice? Why is that significant for some of them? Um, 
So the, the philosophy is that life does not end when our body dies. It goes on. And that's what pretty much all the major religions and philosophies feel as well. And mummification has been practiced by cultures throughout history, throughout time. I mean, when we think of mummification, usually what comes to mind is ancient Egypt because of the spectacular things that have been found there. But if you uh, look around, they found mummies all over the world, South America, North America, China, the uh, early Christians and, and, and Jews were mummified. And the purpose of mummification is to assist the soul, the spirit, the essence, whatever you want to call it, make its journey as you move from this life to whatever your next destination is. And it's using the, one of the principles, the principle of correspondence, you can liken it to when we go on a trip, we just spontaneously drop everything and go. Usually, no, we don't. We prepare for it. We get uh, set up the dates, we make travel arrangements where we're gonna stay and so forth. Why? So that we can go on our journey, it goes as smooth as possible, and that we um, get to experience the enjoy it. And so mummification aids in the essence making that transition. And we preserve the body because you heard the stories of near-death experiences, people pronounced clinically dead and revived. They talk about seeing their body from a, a separate vantage point. Well, when you die, that's going to happen. You're going to see your body, and all of a sudden, you're going to find yourself in very strange surroundings, and you're going to be at a loss going, whoa, what is going on? And the preserved body can sort of act as a grounding mechanism for your essence so that during that transition, people on this side can communicate to you and recite to you a spiritual will, something you've written up before your death happens that you feel will help you guide you along the transition that you're going to make. And that entities on the other side will also assist you in making that transition. And so we leverage mummification to make a more smoother transition during a rite of passage that everybody on this planet is going to go through at some point. Doesn't <laughs> been practiced for a long time. I mean, even in the uh, in the Old Testament, the Hebrews, uh, when Jacob died, they sent forth to Egypt for the physicians, right? And it talks about them bewailing them for forty some odd days, saying prayers of right. And of course, the Egyptians. Uh, bewailed them for 70 days plus the seven days of embalming. Mummification is a very ancient of words. It means to preserve from time and eternity with resins inside and out. And so therefore, when they, when they uh, preserved Jacob or mummified him, basically, they preserved him for time and eternity, right? Same as with, with Israel. Uh, in the Jewish tradition, they said Shiva. Where they sit and pray and read over the books to assist that soul to move from this address to the next. The Catholics, they say the viaticum, same thing, to assist them from this address to the next. Um, the Egyptians, the Egyptian Book of the Dead, and you have the, the Buddhists, they do the same thing, the Lord of Frodo. So basically, this is a very ancient practice. And like I said, I'm a funeral director. And I know when I was going to school back in the day, they always said, your job, the funeralization is for the living. And I always was in the position that I always had an argument, no, it's for the dead. It's to assist them to go on. A long time ago, when a person passed away, the family would bathe them, dress them, take care of them. And it allowed that person to make a smoother transition, their spirit, because the family was there and allowed the family to make a very smooth transition. And back when I was a funeral director, I always offered the family an opportunity to, to participate, maybe do mom's hair or help dress dad. And a lot of times when they got through with that, most of the people that I've ever done that with was just 
very fulfilled with that inside of themselves because it allowed them to make a connection. And for myself, I feel it made the, the, my, the person that happened to be there, the deceased person, it allowed them to make a very smooth transition also. And so this is something that's very ancient. It's always been around. And if you go to the Cairo Museum, they have a whole room that has Christian uh, mummies in there, you know, because they mummify, they preserve their body. And so it's just an old thing that's been around for a long time. And some individuals said it was time for us to reintroduce it. And there's only going to be a handful of people. I mean, you know, this is just the beginning. We have a little pyramid. You know, in Egypt, they have a little pyramid. <laughs> and it's the beginning of something. And so, um, you know, we just made it available. That's it. Now, you mentioned that uh, that ancient Egypt was, uh, you look to the source for the, the pyramid in terms of its construction. Is the same true in terms of the process of mummification, the, the body prepare, or, or is that something different? Well, it's really interesting about the pyramid. I mean, uh, there's archaeologists and scientists that it says the pyramid survived a flood that's over 15,000 years ago. And so... I always ask people, this as well, if they built that, but it's interesting how, how the Egyptians, they wrote down everything, right? They wrote about stories and wars and harvests and famines and this, that, and other. but yet the pyramid does not have one single hieroglyph in it, except for Khufu's name. And it's carved in very crudely in there because I guess he found a way in and he carved his initial just like when we were young and carved our initial in a tree or something right but there is no one that claims building it. even the even the sphinx where they have the tablet in between the sphinx it just simply says that they restored it because it was buried and so people really don't know how old it is and it's a it's an ancient tradition, and basically it's a place where an individual, when they die, it allows them to go through a very smooth transition. It's not a tomb. They never found anybody. They found a sarcophagus where the body was placed in, but it was placed in there in order to meditate over them and allow them to make a transition, and then they were taken out and placed someplace, you know, for their burial. But he wondered. He wanted to know what the difference was between the ancient practice of mummification and ours. Oh, I'm sorry. No, that's all right. That's all right. It's, it's all right. <laughs> it's good, but you might want to continue on. Okay. Uh, the ancient Egyptian uh, mummification process, back in the day, they the only way you preserve something was by by driving the, the moisture out. So they had pack it and salt. What they call that nature. It was just some sand that they got out of the desert. And what it did was dehydrated the body, right? And so when you see somebody that has unwrapped a, an Egyptian mummy, they're all dehydrated. Well, that's how they look when they got through the process before they wrapped them and sealed them. And our process is, is, a, is a formula that Corky came up with in research. It takes a little bit from the genetic engineering world and a few other different chemical worlds where we've come up with a particular formula that allows for the permanent preservation of the body. What it does is we, we do a transfusion, which is what embalming is. As a funeral director, you basically raise a carotid artery and I inject a preservative fluid on one side and it comes out the arterial side and you replace all that fluid with a preservative. Formaldehyde and glutaraldehyde, they're basically gases that are held in solution by methanol, which also wants to be a gas. So all that stuff evaporates out and it does sort of dehydrate the body a bit. Our SLU's formula is, is when we do, we, we also do a transfusion, right? We clear out the blood and we put a solution in there that has a very small molecule. And the molecule is so small that if I drop a drop of that on your finger, you would taste it within about 15 seconds. And that's how porous our skin really is. And so what we do is we infuse the body or embalm the body. Then what we do is we perform uh, an operation and make a surgical incision from the sternum down to the pubic synthesis and we remove all the internal organs, clean everything completely. And then what we do is we take the body and the internal organs and everything and we immerse them in a solution of this formula. 
And what it does is it drives the oxygen out. And by driving the oxygen out, the body is preserved. I mean, if you go to a lab, you'll see something sitting there, a brain or some piece of, of, of um, biological tissue that you just simply drop into some alcohol. Drives out all the oxygen, allows that piece to sit there and it can be preserved for a long period of time. And so basically what we do is just simply re remove all of that. And then we take the body out of the solution after about, uh, about six months to nine months because we want to make sure that the body is completely permeated with our solution. And when we take the body out, they look like they just passed away yesterday. Uh, I had a dog that passed away, old gal, she's really old. Anyway, we mummified her and we took her out of solution um, after seven years, because we were just kind of testing some of the different changes we were making in the formula. When you took, we took her out, you could move the skin around and rub it just like she just passed away. Her eyes were absolutely perfect. No smell. It's just like she passed away yesterday. So absolutely perfect. And so what we do is when we take the body out, we put a lanolin type of solution over the body. And it's sort of a lanolin wax type of solution. So it kind of conditions the skin. And then we start wrapping the body with cotton gauze, just like you would get at the drugstore. First wrapping, you know, the solution and everything makes the gauze really damp. Then we do another layer and another layer. When you get up to about seven layers, all of a sudden it starts becoming very dry because it hasn't ripped its way all the way through that. And then what we do is we paint a beautiful rubber membrane over the top of the whole body. And that's the first layer of the cocoon that the body is, is within. And it's just like when you get a rubber glove and it has uh, cloth inside of it, you know, some of the tougher rubber gloves, how tough it is. Well, that's what we've created around the entire body. And what we do is we have to do it as soon as we take the body out because we do not want oxygen to work its way back into the body, right? And so uh, once we take, um, take the person out of that, we have to work until it's completely sealed. And after that, what we do is we put a fiberglass coating over the top of that. And we use a carbon fiber that goes over the top of that. And that forms a complete chrysalis over that, that uh, the mummy. Then we place the mummy inside of a bronze mama form, which we've created. Like Corky had passed away quite a few years ago. When we mummified him, he had created a mama form that he wanted his body to be in. And so we designed it, we had an artist make it, and then we placed his body in there. And of course we made that thing about 10, 20 years before he died. So we had it ready. So anyway, when we placed him in there, then what we did was we filled the entire thing, we purged all the oxygen out, and then we filled the entire mama form with a resin and silicon sand solution. And the silicon sand and the resin, the silicon sand helps um, cool off the resin as it heats, but it's a real slow, pure resin. It's a very specially designed resin, so it cools slowly because you don't want it to get too hot. So anyway, we fill the entire mama form with that, and it turns in basically into stone. I mean, it is intense. And so, once that's completely filled, we weld off the end of it. And so, uh, like Corky, you can go on the website and see his mama form on the website. He is completely welded inside of a bronze mama form. And there's nothing in nature that corrodes bronze. It forms patina over it. And it says, you can put it on the bottom of the ocean and it'll be there for thousands of years. And it'll be just like the artist created it. And so as long as that mama form stays completely intact, Corky will be absolutely perfect. I mean, you could open up that mama form in a hundred years or a hundred thousand years, and you could have a viewing form. He'd be absolutely perfect. And because we preserve the solutions that we use, preserve the DNA, so that we, because like formaldehyde causes protein linkage and it fuses together and destroys the DNA, our solution does not de destroy the DNA. And so the body is, is preserved perfectly uh, time and all eternity. 
Uh, one of the big misconceptions about our mummification is they assume that we're looking for them to reanimate the body. We are not. That is not the, the reason the body is you know, as mummified. And so we have no intention of, of drilling in there and taking a DNA sample out and cloning the person or anything like that. It is simply like Bernie says, it's a talisman that allows the spiritual soul as it makes its journey from this address to its next address to maybe touch back and kind of remember some of the things it's gone through. So, you know, I really don't want to do that <laughs> next time I move on down the road. And so it makes a very smooth transition from this address to the next address. Well, we've been going for an hour and I know we just wanted to provide a summary and there's a whole lot more that I know you folks could share, but again, in the program notes, we'll direct uh, folks to your website. And uh, I just want to, again, thank you for making the time. I'm amazed we were able to coordinate four schedules and uh, get you three together and, uh, and to have this conversation. I appreciate it very much. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, again, this is the podcast for Multi-Faith Matters. Uh, please check the, uh, the notes to this and our other episodes, we're able just to scratch the surface on these things. And if you want to learn more about some of them, uh, visit their websites. There's plenty there. And I'm sure if anyone is interested and they reach out, they'd be more than happy to answer any questions. Uh, again, this is John Moorhead, the host. And I want to thank everybody for watching and listening until our next episode.